All right, well, I think we'll get going, and there's only a couple of us, but I will um, treat this as a kind of a traditional webinar, so you can feel free to um, sit back, and uh, if there are any questions, obviously, feel free to interrupt, and maybe a couple other people will join while we get going. Um, so this is the uh, a webinar that we're doing on threats to the urban forest, the potential economic impacts of invasive forest pests and diseases in the Northeast. Um, we this is a 2019-2020 uh, regional project that FEMC has uh, conducted, and we're just um, unveiling the tools to this webinar. Um, I'm Jim Duncan. I'm the director for the FEMC. That's my uh, pre-quarantine picture there. Um, I don't quite look like that anymore, but that's all right. One of these days, I'll get a haircut. So the uh, just some quick mechanics about the webinar. Um, we are recording this, so. Uh, that's just to let you know. Um, please mute your mic and um, turn off your video unless you are interested in sharing, that's fine. But if you uh, don't want to share your video, that's also fine. Um, you can use the question and answer box uh, to ask questions during the webinar. I'll be doing my best to monitor. If I see something come up, I'll let you know. You can also use the raise your hand function um, on Teams if you're not familiar with that. And there'll be time at the end for questions as well. So you can uh, wait or put them in and I can try and answer them as we go. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the FEMC is a seven state effort, a regional cooperative to uh, better understand and communicate what's happening with forest ecosystem condition in the Northeast. So we cover New England and the New York states and we try and serve as a hub of monitoring information for the region, as well as novel regional assessment and integration of different data sets to make it easier to understand how forests are changing over time. Um, we work with a lot of practitioners and partners from across the region, from uh, forestry professionals to academics to US Forest Service support people, uh, trying to bring together lots of different organizations and interests, not just on forests, but relating to soils, water, air quality, anything that really can result from or, or contribute to forest change in the region. Uh, we work with our partners in each state to come up with uh, regional projects and state level projects um, every year. And these projects can vary from very specific data aggregations around how hemlock woolly adelgid might affect the stream corridor to larger regional projects like this, where we're really trying to bring together a novel source of information and do something new. So when we were first charged with this project, um, we were looking, we were asked to investigate the uh, potential economic impacts that invasive pests and diseases could have on urban forests in the Northeast. Um, and this set turned around kind of the economic component and communicating with a broader range of stakeholders to make information about trees and the, the pests that they faced uh, more understandable. So we focused on kind of the ecosystem service valuation approach. So what value of, uh, what is the value of the services that are being performed by these urban trees? Uh, what is the cost of replacing these trees? Uh, if they are um, attacked and potentially infested or killed? Uh, what pests are municipalities most vulnerable to? So where do we where do we see different host species being distributed across the region? So we uh, started off with this general charge. It's a pretty broad one for us, um, and having that component of economic impact and analysis was a little bit different, but something we had done before working with iTree and some urban tree inventory here in Vermont in the northwest corner of the state. Um, but one thing we did know is that there are a lot of uh, municipal tree inventories. So these tr inventories have been done for any number of reasons for uh, planning purposes, for actual management of the trees, as part of asset management systems for cities. There are many different ways that people can uh, be collecting this tree information and making it uh, available at least to use in their own municipalities. So the question is how we could uh, get access to that as well. And um, we know that these inventories are often not publicly available. They may not be organized in a standard format, or they may be they may never have been assessed for data errors and complete entries. Sometimes they're collected by volunteers. Uh, sometimes they're collected by one really gung ho person who doesn't know how to identify trees. Um, so we know that there are a host of issues with these inventories. But the biggest challenge that we saw when we started this project is how to actually get access to all of these inventories and begin working with them. So 
the goals of the project were to identify and access as many suitable municipal tree inventories so we could in the Northeast, uh, summarize the economic risks of specific pests and pathogens to the host species in those urban areas, and then develop a way to make this uh, information accessible for outreach and education. And so today I'm going to walk through kind of the background steps on how we built this product, but then uh, spend a little time walking through the tool that came out of it uh, just to show you what you can do with the content we've assembled. So these are the four main steps that we went through to build the tool. The first was actually collecting and archiving available inventories. Next, we had to standardize those inventories. Uh, after all the work we did assessing them, we could only really use 88 of them for some an economic assessment. And then we focused on building a way to make that information accessible and usable. So first up was collect and archive inventories. Uh, this is really a people problem usually. Uh, we were lucky in that there was a group out of North Carolina who had done a large uh, region-wide look at a bunch of urban inventory data for some kind of modeling to try and extrapolate what we know about some inven some urban areas to other urban areas based on site characteristics. So they had already done a lot of work to identify who was holding municipal tree inventory data and how we could get access to it. So we were able to get access to 237 inventories. We say municipal inventories in some cases, this also includes college campus inventories, but large, like the vast majority of them are for municipalities. Um, these inventories covered six states. Uh, we didn't get any from Rhode Island through this effort, um, and it may have just been a search effort issue when we started it up a year or more ago. These inventories span 27 years, so some have been collected as far back as 1993, and some are very recent. In some cases, a municipality would have multiple inventories, a re-inventory um, on a periodic basis. Uh, you can see that the bulk, in terms of counts, came from New York. Uh, there's been a very strong effort to centralize information about tree inventories in New York. Um, Connecticut had a, a well-centralized uh, effort, as does Vermont, for at least collecting some of that uh, tree inventory information. Uh, fewer numbers coming from Maine and New Hampshire. There just wasn't, uh, there wasn't as much centralized uh, effort happening at the state level. So once we got our hands on all the debt, all the data, and these are places where we did at least get some summary or raw data from. We then archived these inventories. Um, the URLs shown below, and I think it was sent out in the webinar announcement as well. But we took each inventory and archived it on the FEMC in its original format. So however it came to us, we put it up on the archive. Uh, we also spent a fair bit of time working with the publishers to make it public. Some people just had never been asked. Um, some people. Uh, used to say no, and now they're saying yes to making it available. Um, but as we've added these data sets to the archive, we've seen uh, requests for these data through the FEMC grow over time. So I think this is a source of data that was um, of interest to others in the region. So we've made uh, entries for as many inventories as possible, and I think we've made um, about a third of them downloadable to date, and we're continuing to uh, try and open up more of those data sets so people can grab them themselves. So that's one uh, potentially useful output from this project is that we can make it easier to access all this data and quickly find it. The step that we had to then take was to standardize what we could out of the suitable inventories. Um, so how do we take the garbledy gook of whatever one municipality does and turn it into something that uh, can be compared across all municipalities? I shouldn't say the garbledy gook, it's just their version of how to store data. To us, sometimes it was garbledy gook. <laughs> uh, so we, the first thing we had to do is figure out how we had to exclude some inventories. Uh, some of the reasons that we had to exclude inventories, they might have an undefined species or diameter system. Um, some inventories would just have a diameter class and say one, two, three, four, but we didn't know what those would correspond to and we couldn't get an answer on what they meant. Or they'd have a number of un undefined species names that we couldn't match with re reasonable certainty to any known species code system. So there are a number of um, inventories we couldn't include for that reason. A uh, second reason is that we might have multiple inventories at the same place. Uh, in some cases, you might have a street tree inventory and a park inventory and a full public tree inventory and a campus inventory um, and what the, from different years. So we use the rule of thumb to try to use the most recent and complete. So if there's a full public tree inventory that could include parks and streets, we'd use that first. Uh, after that, we'd use a, 
street tree inventory because it'd be more uh, representative of the municipality as a whole. If we didn't have a street tree inventory, we would use a park tree inventory because at least it gives us some information about what species are existing in that municipality. Um, and that would be kind of where we would stop. So if someone just had a campus inventory, we probably would not include it unless the campus basically was the municipality. Um, we couldn't use most of those college university campus inventories because in most cases, the municipality also had an inventory. So we just used that one. So after dealing with all these exclusions and trying to figure out as much as we could about the data that we were given, we had about 88 municipalities that had one good representative inventory for that city or town. So the next step we used was iTree Eco, which is, uh, it's been around for a while, um, about at least about eight years to allow people to collect inventory data and quantify ecosystem services uh, for a number of factors based on a tree inventory. Um, so we used this uh, iTree Eco software to process the inventory data and then to get it into iTree Eco, we had to do at a minimum the tree genus and the diameter. Um, so that's what Eco needs to be able to quantify at least some level of ecosystem service benefit where possible. We try and provide the species. So to get it ready for iTree, uh, we had to do a fair bit of work from the raw inventory data. We'd start out with actually cleaning the taxonomy. So we would uh, run it through an R package called Taxonomy Cleaner that will do a very good job of matching up either common names or uh, scientific names, or even some, in some cases, tree species codes from USDA plants to a uh, known taxonomic authority. We use the integrated taxonomic information system. And uh, where it couldn't figure it out or there was some degree of uncertainty, we would do our best to look at what the possible meanings were. Usually we could identify the trouble species based on whether or not it actually occurs in the region or would survive in that climate zone. Um, so wherever possible, we we let the machines do it where we needed to. We stepped in and used some human interpretation. So once we had cleaned up the taxonomy and standardized it to a, a common code list, we could get those iTree species codes that we needed. And then we had to do, we might have had to do some diameter cleaning. Uh, in some, place, some cases, we had diameter classes instead of diameters themselves. So 5 to 10 inches, 10 to 15 inches, whatever the case may be. We would use the upper limit um, of the diameter class uh, because we had to choose one. So if it was 10 to 15 inches, we would use 15 inches as the diameter for the tree. So we had to convert that into a, a single value for use in I tree. And then uh, we submitted it through iTree Eco. And if you haven't used iTree Eco before, generally you have to provide information about where the inventory took place because it'll use local weather station data and local pollution data to tailor the estimates of the services. And then it um, does the processing based on location information, your weather, and the tree inventory to produce a, a assessment of economic evaluation. And that's where we were trying to get to for each of these inventories. So we did this process for the 88 that we could use. So the next step was assessing those 88 inventories and uh, turning their outputs into something that was meaningful in terms of pests and diseases. Um, this is about 30%, 37% of the total number of inventories we had. So we couldn't consider it, well, we could, but we decided not to consider all possible species. We focused on eight that have some relevance or importance here in the Northeast. Uh, those are Asian longhorn beetle, beech leaf disease, brown tail moth, emerald ash borer, and gypsy moth. A uh, fairly unusual one for urban areas, but hemlock woolly adelgid, as well as oak wilt and spotted lantern fly, which is a uh, up and coming one. We looked at each of these diseases or pests and identified their primary host genera. Um, in some cases, it's a long list, such as Asian longhorn beetle or brown tail moth have a pretty um, wide number of species that they'll affect. Um, they might prefer one over another, but we just included all genera uh, to understand kind of the potential, the full potential impact if a pest were to become really established and active in an area. And so we use this uh, information to kind of limit down the um, benefits being provided by trees of these hosts. So the values that we looked at 
uh, to quantify, we focused on three annual values. The first one is avoided runoff. So this is uh, as trees grow and establish, their leaf area can intercept rainfall, their roots can soak up rainfall. Um, so this can reduce the impact, or this can avoid stormwater runoff and thus treatment by a stormwater treatment plant or a sewage treatment plant. So <clears throat> there are calculations with an eye tree to estimate the value of not having that water end up in the sewer system. So that was the value, and that's a per year value. So again, if uh, you have a year with low rain, this, this value will be lower. Years of high rain, this value might actually go up. But we uh, captured an annual basis for the, mo the most recent year. The second annual value was carbon sequestration. So obviously, as trees grow, most of the time as they grow, they pull in more CO2 than they emit, and that can be stored as new biomass. So we calculated the annual sequestration value of all the trees in the municipality and how those would have been affected if all those trees were removed by a pest. And then the third is probably the most valuable uh, component of trees, uh, urban trees, is pollution removal. They filter out a significant amount of uh, noxious chemicals and irritants. Um, so removal of carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrates and sulfates, and particulate matter um, all of which have pretty serious health effects. So there's been a number of studies showing that the reduction in tree uh, cover in a city can increase the health costs of pollution. Um, so this is a pretty big component of uh, urban tree services performed. So those three are on annual basis. Um, on a overall basis, there's a total value which of the trees, which if you had to replace a tree with a same species, same size, what's the cost? in terms of uh, purchasing and then planting and then maintaining that tree until it gets to that size again. Um, so there's a structural value, which obviously becomes much larger than the annual values these services are providing. Um, but we estimated or we calculated both. So for these pests and diseases on the right, we took the iTree Eco output and looked at how much the an individual pest or disease would put at risk based on the host species. Um, and then we also provided just a summary by species and size class as an additional service to kind of the municipality if they needed it or the user. And then we took both of these and provided a summary of how much value and what the characteristics are of the inventory. Looking across everything that we assessed, um, this is the distribution uh, by genus and diameter uh, for some of the top genera, genera in the region, as well as uh, overall proportion, uh, maple is unsurprisingly a huge part of our urban landscape, um, both in terms of native maples as well as Norway maple. There just is a lot of there are a lot of urban trees planted as maple, and we also have uh, substantial portions in basswood, which includes both little leaf linden and American basswood. Um, we have oak and ash species uh, represented on this landscape. Interestingly, oak shows an opposite pattern by size class. If you look, it's got a, a large number of young cohorts and a large number of very old, very large, um, and kind of a, a dip in the middle. Um, that is unlike most of the other species, other genera where you have a uh, pretty well established larger size class, but not a whole lot of smaller size classes coming up behind it. So. This could indicate you know, an aging forest in the urban areas that may not have uh, as many younger trees planted or hasn't gone through a wave of uh, removals and replantings, which might explain the oak curve. Um, and then we also see uh, the kind of decorative flowering fruit trees, such as in the malus and pine, or, uh, prunus and uh, pear families or pear genera. So those are, um, showing kind of more weighting towards uh, smaller size classes. And if you look at just the number of trees estimated by iTree across the region, we have half of them in maple and the remainder in other species, uh, oak and basswood being the two, the second and third largest uh, groups of genera. So when we just sum the estimated annual values, um, these numbers are fairly large. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this could be pretty alarming, but I'll just point out this is the what could be at risk. So if Asian longhorn beetle came into all the municipalities that we inventoried and killed all of the host trees, 
that are out there that would represent $2.4 million of lost services being provided by those trees in our region every year. Um, in reality, ALB is not going to uh, kill off all of the trees in our region. Uh, something like emerald ash borer, on the other hand, could have a pretty significant effect um, based on just those 88 municipalities. We'd be losing about $140,000 of services every year. Um, Hemlock woolly adelge is fairly small because we just don't have that much hemlock in our urban areas, similar to beech, where we just don't have a lot of beech in our urban forest. Uh, so though beech leaf disease can be pretty high mortality, we don't see a lot of beech impact in our forests. Looking at something like oak wilt, which only has one host genus, um, you can see the potential losses are pretty large there, $405,000 a year in services that we're not receiving anymore. And spotted lanternfly, gypsy moth, and brown tail moth, all along with ALB, represent these multi genera species. But so just to emphasize again, this is what could be at risk in total. We also looked at the overall structural values, huge numbers. Um, this is again because some, if you remember the curve on maple and oak, there's lots of larger trees as those get removed, the um, cost it takes to get a tree of that size and species back established on the landscape is quite large. Um, but I think these are also useful just to communicate how much we've already invested in our trees in urban areas. Just thinking about what we've invested to get our ash stock to the size and condition it's in, um, you know, we have $44 million sunk into those trees. And so emerald ash borer coming through uh, threatens that uh, potential investment. And we have, to, if we want to have a forest that looks like what we see out there today, we're going to need to invest some time and money to get that back. So this uh, table in the report just shows the uh, total structural value. And so this is not an annual value. This is just the actual replacement cost. Looking at a map just to see how this is distributed, I know it's a little bit hard to see um, in the because it's all in the same scale and structural value just outweighs everything else. But you can see kind of hot spots of annual uh, value that we have across the region um, in uh, central and western New York, uh, southern Massachusetts, and Connecticut. We have several municipalities that are receiving a substantial amount of benefit each year from the urban forests that are at risk. Uh, based on these uh, invasive species and diseases. Um, in terms of structural value, some heavily clustering in probably larger urban areas shown in uh, southern New Hampshire and central Massachusetts and western New York, um, but still uh, seeing some substantial cost risk across the entire region. If we look at uh, the, the average estimated value per tree. So this is how much of the service divided by the number of trees. Um, this shows you kind of the total uh, across all the different genera and potential pests what we're seeing. So we have about two dollars of a per tree being provided uh, for those trees at risk for runoff, 210 for carbon sequestration. I mentioned pollution removal is a much larger benefit. Um, so each tree is giving us about seven dollars, six and a half dollars of value each year that's at risk. Um, and our average structural value is $2,600 per tree, uh, which if you purchase a tree before, you know, you can get a two inch tree for $500 um, to $1,000. So this is, uh, this is showing the value of that larger stock that's at risk. So all of this information is summarized in the report that we produced, um, but more importantly than a report, we wanted to try and make information accessible and usable. And to do this, we, took two tacks. One is to come up with a fact sheet. Um, we didn't want to uh, rely on people to dig into a data, uh, a data set or a, a report to get this information out. So we created a customized fact sheet for each municipality that's data driven. So it's easy to update. Um, but when someone's clicking through the site, they can actually just download this fact sheet uh, for up to four pests. Um, so they can get, uh, we tailored the pests to the municipality based on what we thought would be the most, um, the species of most interest. So for uh, this one, which is shown for Rochester, New York, we chose spotted lanternfly, Asian longhorn beetle, beech leaf disease, and oak wilt because those are uh, potentially more relevant in the near term than say EAB or hemlock woolly adelgid. So we customize it to four, but we could switch it around to any other four if people wanted. 
but this fact sheet is something that's downloadable from the site and can be regenerated as new data comes in. And then the other piece that we in, spend time building is an online map and catalog of this information. And this uh, provides a place where users can browse for that inventory data, access those fact sheets, and then link back to the archive if what they're interested in is the data. And at this point, I'm gonna step out of the uh, project, or sorry, of the presentation, and just show you a little bit more on the project. So here at this uh, URL up here, which is in the webinar announcement, um, this is just an overview page about the project. So it gives you a little bit more uh, information about what we did, um, shows an example of the fact sheet, the uh, pests that we considered, and um, the products that came out of it. So we have our technical report, um, which again describes kind of how we did what we did and what we found, and then the interactive map that we can look at in a second. The other nice piece about this page is it just lists out all the tree inventory data that we collected. Um, so this is everything that we have. Um, we made indications of whether there's a fact sheet available for it, whether or not there are data sets. Um, sometimes we have the data, but it, they didn't want to share it. So it's marked as description only, but in some cases it's downloadable so you can access the actual data itself. Um, so where possible, we try to get both the fact sheet and the available data, but um, to be downloadable. Um, so you could search for Massachusetts or New York and get uh, quickly get those data sets that are available, that are um, matching your needs. And then just a little bit more information on our products, uh, as well as the embedded map uh, below. So you can browse the map here, or you can launch it into its own page here. Um, so when you open this up, you would see this view of the entire Northeast and a little bit of information about this uh, map and how to use it. So that's shown on the left here. If you want more background or if you need instructions on how to use it, it gives uh, some information on that. The municipalities are shown here. So these are any municipality that had an inventory, not necessarily ones that we did a fact sheet for. Um, you can uh, search for a municipality. So for example, I could look at Bath. Um, so Bath, Maine, um, it'll jump you right over to that uh, municipality and you can either link to the data or to the fact sheet. So for Bath, I can click on the fact sheet and see uh, what the summary show for that municipality. Uh, here we're showing EAB, ALB, brown tail moth, and hemlock lily adelgid. Uh, it gives a total number of host trees in the inventory. So there are 265 host trees for EAB. Um, total annual value from carbon sequestration, runoff, and air pollution, and total structural value to replace that. Um, so it gives it for AOB, hemlock willow delta, there's a paltry 12 uh, hemlock trees in the municipality, and then uh, brown tail moth, the uh, exposure as much as the greatest of the four. Uh, it gives information on the county, the population, the inventory year. This is a quite old inventory that we had to use. Um, and then it gives on the second page a breakdown of the tree inventory by population, leaf area, and importance value. Large number of Norway maple, sugar maple, red maple, and then down into some less common ones like elm and ash. Uh, we also gave the diameter distribution by genus and the proportion by genus. So this is replicating what you saw in the overall report. Coming back to here, you can also click the link for the data. Um, and here it'll give a citation. If there's any additional links, you can uh, click there to find them. Uh, there are a list of the data sets. Um, clicking through to here, you can actually uh, download the data, get more information. It's got 4,800 records and 46 fields, a citation for that data set. Um, and then whatever metadata and other documents and images we have on that will be associated with that project here. So that, I can't see that. So that's a, a piece that you can zoom to from this map. The other way to use this is to just look at what's available. Um, so if we sc scroll back out and you're interested in kind of the southern New England area, um, you can go in here and then actually uh, filter by map extent. I'm just going to collapse this window here. And it'll only list out uh, 
the municipalities that you have in your view. So if you further zoom in here, um, you'll see the New York inventories go away and you have access to just listing those inventories that are in your view. So this can be a good way to explore to see what's available in an area you care about. And you'll know whether there's a fact sheet by whether there's something in this column as well. Um, so you can see we have a uh, number of inventories in this area and about half of them have fact sheets that you can use. Um, so clicking on something like Worcester, you can get the fact sheet there or access to the data set. Um, you can filter by county, so you can put in uh, Westchester County and hit enter. And it'll bring us over here to anything with the Westchester County, so um, New Rochelle or uh, or Memorinic. Probably butchered that name. Um, so this is another way that you can use the tool. Uh, pretty simple interface. The goal here again was just to make it clear what's available and what we have um, and then uh, get people to the data or to the fact sheet as quickly as possible. Uh, looking at possible steps for the future, um, we are considering this project kind of wrapped up at this point unless we're asked to work on it more, but we did identify things that could be done. Uh, we have um, a bunch of inventories that probably could be included if we could figure out the species codes. Uh, we tallied up 79, so almost double what we have now, or the same amount again as what we have now that have an unknown species coding system that if we had it, we could process it. We've got 51 that we know we can't do anything with because they are summaries or they're incomplete. Um, we could continue to locate and archive inventories. This uh, effort certainly got a good number, but there are a whole bunch of holes in that map with places that most likely have urban tree inventory. Um, so those could be added. Um, we could evaluate them with ECO and then update the online map. All the work that was done to create these and extract the information from iTree is automated and available on the website in script so that they're available for others to use as well. Um, we could assess additional inventories for a single municipality. So if we know that there's been a more recent inventory, we could go and add that back in. So update, say, Bath, Maine, maybe not rely on 1993 data, but upgrade to whatever they have more current, more recently and then assess a subset of inventories. So we never really looked at how assessing a municipality based on its park trees could compare to just assessing it based on its street trees um, or how the campus might compare to the larger town. So there's some op there could be some opportunities for kind of getting a little bit more specific around uh, within a municipality, what we want to assess and how we want to quantify the risk. We could expand the fact sheet in the map, uh, accommodate presenting more inventories um, uh, differently or include other information that right now we just we started with this, but there's certainly room to expand that work. So these are all things that could be done in the future. Um, FEMC as an organization is, is closing this up, but if there's requests, we can certainly uh, take those back. But also if anyone's interested in seeing any of these happening, uh, we could get in touch and talk about what the needs are. I think having some feedback from the community and from the larger group about how we can make this better and more usable can help our kind of governing committees figure out if this is something we should keep working on. So with that, um, I'm uh, kind of wrapping up the portion I wanted to present on. I do want to thank some folks, uh, Alexandra Kasiba, Emma Tate, Matthias Search, and Jean Desideragio. Alex Belisle and Nina Doe all contributed to this project by uh, going through species lists, uh, building designs for the website and for the uh, flyer, um, coordinating all the effort. There's a lot of work that went into it. We're really lucky to have uh, Mark Ambrose and Frank Koch from the US Forest Service and Fred Cowett from Cornell uh, provided us the initial seed of uh, over 150 inventories and pointed us in a lot of helpful directions. Um, Jeff Ward from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station uh, provided a number of inventories and insight, as did Elise Shadler from uh, Vermont Urban and Community Forestry. And uh, I'd like to thank the US Forest Service Eastern Region and UVM and uh, the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation for funding that supported this work. So with that, um, that is the end of the formal presentation part of the webinar. And I have not been monitoring notes or chat as I was going, so I apologize if anyone's placed anything in there, but I'll check now and ask if there are any questions. And if you can either type your questions into the chat box or you can uh, just unmute yourself and ask whichever you prefer.
Should I take that that there are no questions? Or are you unable to mute yourself? Great. Well, I will uh, wrap it up then there. I, if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is there and explore the project more. And if you have anything that you wish you could see added to this project, like I said, extracting the invasive species information is probably the easiest thing that we can do at this point. Um, most of the work went into processing those inventories. If you see a municipality that you want on the map, let us know. With that, um, thank you very much for joining the FEMC webinar. I really appreciate you taking the time and I hope to see some of you again soon. Take care all. Oh wait, somebody chatted. Sorry, my computer's being slow. Yep, thanks, you're welcome. Can't wait to talk to you again. Everyone have a great day, uh, stay dry and we'll talk to you soon, bye.